hand in hand with, let's say, right here in Baltimore that are helping um, communication and facilitating your, your missions? Um, I think that the, the nice thing about the Baltimore Museum community is it's very collaborative. So uh, there are you know, different partnerships at different times depending on, on what we're doing. It just it just varies from time to time. We did do a, a collaboration with the contemporary Jennifer reminded me many years back before my time, where, where we actually did an exhibition of bread making or something, or bread little bread sculptures or something. Mm -hmm. they were yeah. Deepak, I'm curious. Um, you have some real aspirations with wiring the city, wiring this area. Are there any stumbling blocks that you hit when you have any of these goals with um, with veteran community? And are there any um, organizations that could help um, knock down some of these stumbling blocks in order to, to create this better open access? You don't have to name names if you don't want to, but I guess, I mean, are, is there opposition to what you hope to accomplish? So the, the question about what stumbling blocks we've had, people don't have enough hours in the day. Um, so we'll skip over that part. Um, so right now, our ideas, for example, to, to bring access throughout the city are relatively new. We've had a lot of positive uh, communications with folks. And I think it's really time for us to put up or shut up. And so we're going to keep putting up. Um, I think that you know we're engaging with everyone we can think of, and that includes government, and that includes, um, like I said, stakeholders in the area, our biggest fear is, I think, one that technology companies have uh, accidentally stumbled into all the time, and that is being tone deaf. We think, like in this seat and my team, that free Wi-Fi is great and it's a universal good, but that may not be every opinion. That may not be every voice. And so we are trying to engage throughout the city and throughout all of the folks that we can identify to make sure that we're doing it in a sensitive way, that we are not uh, raising specters of big brother or surveillance or gosh knows what else, privacy, cyber risk. Um, and, and once we get sort of brought into a conversation about fears or concerns, maybe we can address them. Um, and certainly some of the folks uh, we've talked to have informed maybe how we're going to deploy, which areas first, that kind of thing. Um, and we've got some strategies to make everybody safer and more secure. But again, uh, folks who haven't been invited to the conversation, uh, we don't know what they're thinking. <clears throat> and so we're trying to engage with everybody to help avoid some of those uh, very famous but very public screw-ups. Richard. He sounds like a social worker. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think you're a social worker, too. Um, what are some of your challenges that your organization faces? What, what would... Um, like what would what would be an ideal situation that can help further the University of Maryland School of Social Work achieve some of its accomplishments? So I think our challenges, our opportunities are um, multiple. The, we have many roles in the School of Social Work. The one that I focused on is as community school coordinators, and one of the things that we're probably facing in Baltimore City, frankly, is a reduction of both library and art services in the schools. Those are the kind of things that historically have gotten cut first. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we could get a shuttle that would take our students from just across Martin Luther King and up Pennsylvania Avenue to spaces like this to come into the arts district to get art instruction as it gets reduced in, in the schools. What if we could really pair up our students with the art community? I think that would be really quite amazing. A bigger challenge that we have in some ways is that our, big, our largest focus is on the behavioral health of our citizenry, uh, the, trying to address the mental health and substance abuse needs of our community. And although a lot of that has got to be done face to face, there are huge opportunities for people to get better, to do well with um, electronic and digital support. So there's no reason that uh, if you're, someone you know is having a psych emergency 
or a substance abuse um, emergency, that you have to take them to the hospital or have the police take them to the hospital where they can go wait in the waiting room for four to five hours, no disrespect intended, um, to get medication, to, um, or maybe not to get anything because the waiting room, you know, they get sent home. Um, they should be able to, to um, get online. Someone should have a, a social worker or a police officer or a friend, should have a netbook where they can call up a psychiatrist, they can do a face-to-face -face interview, they can get a prescription, they can go to a central place where that prescription, uh, there could be almost like a vending machine that can be downloaded. It's, I don't mean to give simple answers, but we actually do have partners that are working on how to do this. So the whole behavioral health world um, needs much more digitalization. We need that in order to be providing evidence-based services and access to many people you know and we all see uh, in, in Baltimore who uh, need better care and should be able to get that care in an efficient kind of way that digitally um, informed interventions could And Will, I guess my question to you, um, I mean, I know that there's been talk, but well, there's been instances here and also like out in Oakland where there's been like studio space for artists have been difficult to, to come by. And your organization kind of blurs the art form between, um, or the, 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 between work and art, not to say one is not one without the other. Can you just um, talk about like some of the, um, some of your feelings in regards to having open spaces for, and, and who you could collaborate with or could bring into your organization to help even further what you do at Open Space. Open Works, excuse me. Well, one of the opportunities I'm really excited about with Open Works is there's been a bunch of development along the Greenmount Corridor over the last couple of years. Uh, starting north of North Avenue, there's a bunch of new affordable housing. Um, going up and then right around us there's City Arts 1 and 2, there's Baltimore Design School, just south of us is Lillian Jones Apartments, um, some of the historic buildings going even further south like the Yellow Bowl Restaurant are starting to see some sparks of life and it's a really exciting time to be kind of in these neighborhoods and what's important to me is that OpenWorks has a unique role in this ecosystem in that it is a truly public space. We have a coffee shop in the lobby with free Wi-Fi and an open door for 12 hours a day and anybody can walk in there and it's welcome. Um, as opposed to an apartment building or a school or other things that are kind of for the people that use them. Um, and so how do we create a strong internal community that's uh, of our members and folks attending classes but also welcome in all the residents of Johnson Square, Greenville West and Barclay um, and, and points further out from us and become a true kind of one of these rare places in Baltimore where a lot of different folks melt together. Um, we've had a few encouraging, we're, we're still kind of early in, but we have had some, a few things kind of encouraging in that, that regard. One of our members just painted a mural at the Greenmount West Community Center. And so looking at those type of organic interactions that occurred just because we built the platform not because I introduced anybody or forced anything, but that just happened organically because we exist. And so how do we keep growing that type of thing onwards and outwards? Now before we open up the, the room for, for questions and answers, I want to ask one more question for each one of the panelists, and this isn't really a popularity contest, but um, which I'm going to ask you, is there another person on this stage that represents an organization that you would want to partner with, that you could partner with, that would easily facilitate your missions? What is it, which, who on this stage could, would make for an easy partner for you to, to further, to reach, whether it's in with, between the two organizations or within the whole downtown area of the city? Um, uh, Kirby. Uh, what would be a good, I'm just sorry, <laughs> wake up, there we go. Yeah, who, would, who would make an easy partner for your organization? Well, we somehow connect to all the partners here, except for Will, so I'm curious to figure out how we can connect more with Open Works. Uh, but actually, what came to mind more so was what we could do more with the school of social work, because 
we have homeless outreach coordinators and, and directors at the downtown partnership. And while we need more housing, we need more service for people with mental illness and also drug dependency. And I know through work at Lexington Market, your students are already uh, making a difference there. We, we paid for the first substance abuse outreach coordinator to be around Lexington Market area. Uh, but I'm seeing, unfortunately, uh, an increase in people who have these needs on the streets and we're not doing enough to help them. So I think uh, I'd like to consider other ways to continue to work with the school social work. Richard, how do you, how do you, would you want to respond to that? And is that, um, the, the, do you follow along those lines as being a natural fit? Absolutely. Um, I think the university has had a very close relationship with the downtown partnership. Uh, we want to continue in that way. Um, we actually have a new initiative in our school, um, a homelessness council that's trying to, um, that's pulling together uh, social workers from Howard, Coppin, Morgan, um, uh, Healthcare for the Homeless, um, Marion's House, uh, to try to figure out how we can better respond day in and day out to uh, training, preparing, and um, supporting those who are working on homelessness. So that, that would be a natural. Um, we're still very excited in terms of partnerships about um, trying to uh, provide the kind of on the ground knowledge of what's going on in West Baltimore, not from me and my coach in the Queen's <coughs> office, but from our community school and outreach workers and combining with AI Net. Um, and the idea of having some of our students, for example, in Renaissance Academy, um, spend some Saturdays uh, at Open Works and otherwise get involved. Dina, your organization seems to like to think out of the box. Mm -hmm. How about somebody on this stage that they think could be an interesting partner and could be a new type of, yeah. of, of, of relationship? So again, I think we've worked with everyone. So yeah. I'm going to say that those were all wonderful experiences. Um, I, am, I am really interested in um, the digital divide, like as a citizen in Baltimore. And I'm curious about this last thing you said, Deepak, about ways that even thinking about um, absolving a digital divide could be problematic if we're not sensitive and open to communities and to individuals who are different than us, you know, in every way. So I'm, I'm interested in just that in general, and it sounds like it's happening in lots of ways that are exciting and interesting. Um, yeah. Deepak, how would you like to answer with that? Um. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, uh, we, we work with basically everybody here, and yeah. more importantly, the, the ideals, I think, that they're all pursuing. Um, what Rick's team does with uh, direct involvement in people's homes, uh, in very, very challenging environments. It's, it's God's work. Um, on this hand, too, great. Right? Uh, art and, and humanities are also God's work. Um, not that I'm not religious, but it, it's important. Um, so I think that I'm fresh out today of, of new groundbreaking uh, collaborations. <laughs> um, I think there's uh, this dialogue is going to lead to that, right? And um, that could manifest in feeding some folks that need it, as well as educating them and connecting them and helping them find work. And I think that everybody here has has a vote in that, and, a, and a works every day to make that happen. Anita, I know what it's like to, to work for a nonprofit organization and the struggles and challenges that that, that that has year after year. Tell me a little bit about like what what who here could help you? Who or what organization in this city um, could give the best boost to what you do? Well, I'm going to pick from the panel. You pick from the panel as well. It's like the yeah. dating game. Will I actually? <laughs> yeah, I just wonder. <laughs> So, and we've actually had this conversation. Um, I think that uh, the Museum of Industry's links to the maker movement are, are evident and, and natural, and Will has actually put it very well, and I'm gonna paraphrase you again here, but um, in pointing out sort of the through line between Baltimore's, the, the sort of scrappy entrepreneurialism that helped build Baltimore and the maker movement today. Um, and, you know, because in the end, we are a, a museum about making this stuff. So, um, there are maker spaces in museums, kind of, that's been done. Um, what I'm more interested in is um, using some beautiful space we have, and I've talked to Will about this, and 
finding a maker in residence who will work there gratis in exchange for interacting with my visitors. Um, sort of on the, on the grounds that if you can't bring pay, people to the maker space, bring the maker, maker space to the people, people who might, might not otherwise um, come into the maker space. And I think what a museum, a, a history museum, like ours has to offer to enhance that experience is that we can draw the historical connections between whatever the maker is doing today and what its historic antecedents are in Baltimore. So it provides a really um, a, a, a unique way to, um, to present the public with this idea of the democratization of making things. So. Well, I'd like to know how, how you would respond to that. I mean, 